three weeks after settling in for the construction of the railway bridge across the Savo River, who would have guessed that one laid-back night would lead to one of the most gruesome experiences and the most terrifying beast attacks in the history of mankind? <laughs> Assigned to Kenya by the Foreign Office of Uganda Railway to oversee the bridge's construction across the Savo River, Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson arrived in Kenya in March of 1898. This experience in Africa was one of the lieutenant's lifelong desires, and so on arrival the lieutenant took in the beauty of the African landscape in all of its essence. Settling into this new environment, Patterson pitched up his tent in the main camp with about 3,000 of his workmen. Following the settlement, more men and supplies were sent down to the lieutenant for the immediate commencement of this project. On arrival at the camps, Patterson stated that he had expected a lot of difficulties, from a possible scarcity of both water and food, to terrible fevers, getting sunstruck, and of course, considering his mission to the field, a load of engineering difficulties. On the fateful night of the 25th of March, after a long day of supervising all the work being done on the site and figuring out solutions to the engineering problems faced, Patterson looked upon the sunset and decided to retire into his quarters to finally get some rest. Unbeknownst to him, this night, unlike the past three weeks since his arrival, was going to be very different, deadlier than he could have ever imagined. The workmen began to slowly troop into their tent for the night stretching out their tired body. Considering the warm evening, the men chose to leave their tent doors open as they slept. In one of these tents pitched at the edge of the main work camp lay the Sikh Jemadar, Ungar Singh, serving as the foreman and chaperone for Patterson and guarding the tent's entrance. The hard labor from this day had left him completely wiped, and so he fell right asleep, which little did he know was the worst mistake he ever could have made. At around midnight, a lion started stalking the men, hiding in the tall grass in the field right outside of their tents. Shadowed by the thick darkness of the night, and with all the campfires completely burned out, this beast could easily make its way into the open tent flat. At this time, three of the work, for reasons unknown, awoke from their sleep, and as they lifted their heads from their sacks that served as pillows and took a look around, they could tell that something wasn't right. Sitting still, their bodies dripping sweat from their underarms and lower backs. And in that stillness, they began to hear something. And as it grew closer, they were certain it was footsteps. Soon it grew even clearer as they heard snorts and huffs and even more steps. In no time, their eyes fell upon the huge figure that wove through the grass and had covered their tent. And instinctively, their focus went straight to the tent flap they had left open. Sleeping peacefully very close to the flap of his tent was none other than Patterson's foreman, Ungan Singh, with his dastar partially sitting over his eyes. With fear in their eyes, the men spotted the shadow crawling up to the canvas in a silhouette that swelled and stretched almost as long as two men, and then it vanished. As their eyes kept darting in the same three directions, the tent walls, the open flap, and one another, they hoped and prayed that this beast of prey had gone to find its prey elsewhere. That thought was held for a minute, because just then, the next thing they saw was a lion's head as it welcomed itself into their tent through the open flaps. Its large, broad face scanned the tent, tasting the air with its jaws wide open. Its long, sharp canines weren't hidden in the thick darkness, and only inches away from its head was Sing, still asleep. You can only imagine these men praying that it doesn't spot Singh, who lay right below it. Warning him was almost impossible. If they shouted, they risked drawing the lion's attention to themselves. So, in sheer grip of terror of this ferocious beast, not a single sound could leave their lips. They and Singh at this point were in the hands of fate. Taking in a quick breath through its open mouth, the beast's tongue sat on the distar fabric. And soon its attention was drawn to the figure that lay right below the fabric. Almost immediately, the razor shark canine sank straight into Singh's neck, and dark blood followed. In pain and utter confusion, Singh's eyes shot open and could only manage to let out a horrifying scream. 
In a sheer show of bravery and strength, Singh tried to fight back against the lion. He tried to gouge its face, its eyes, and even attempting to strangle its neck. But all of his efforts were, as expected, useless. Strangling the lion was like strangling a tree trunk. It just wouldn't budge. With all the strength in his loins, Singh had fought as hard as he could. But that was no match for the beast that easily pulled him out from the tent, making its way through the tall grasses with his body still in its mouth. Still gripped in fear, his bunkmates and all the others that had heard Singh scream lay still, listening. Listening closely to the crunching and the tearing of Singh's bones and flesh a few yards away from the camp. With the sight that they had all witnessed still playing in their heads, the workmen sat awake, still in shock, until morning. The next morning, Lieutenant Patterson was awoken by one of them who rushed with the news that one of his Jemadar was carried off by a huge lion the night before. Apparently, this wasn't the first time that this had happened. In fact, just a few days after Patterson's arrival, two workmen mysteriously vanished, and he was told that they were carried off by lions from their tents. But for some reason, Patterson made no account of those earlier experience. But in this case, on hearing that his foreman had been captured and devoured, Patterson quickly picked up his 303 and made off to first confirm that A, the story was true, and upon getting to the camp, all the evidence pointed to the fact that this gruesome event was very true. His foreman had indeed been dragged off and torn to bits by the king of the jungle. Outside the tent, the sand was scattered with pug marks, and following that trail of pug marks into the bush was easy, considering that it was several stops, that its several stops had left large pools of blood through the root with blood-stained bushes, but that wasn't it. Just ahead, there was another significant sign of the lion's presence, as a flock of vultures flew out from one isolated tree, pointing to what happened to be Singh's remains. Just beneath the tree were very small chunks of flesh and bones, but the most gruesome sight of all that the lieutenant witnessed was Singh's head still intact, just separated from his remains. His eyes were still wide open in what was clearly pain and horror written all over his face with his mouth wide open in a permanent scream for both help and pain. The men buried all of the remains that they could spot and simply wrapped Singh's head yards of canvas and carried it back to the camp in a sack. In an account of the incident later written by Patterson, he described this horrifying scene as the most gruesome sight that he'd ever come across, and in fact, referred to this event exacted by the savage beast as a human sacrifice. Singh's death haunted him, and all of the events he had encountered in his adventurous life as a British soldier and hunter, well, this one in particular, left him scarred for life. After much examination of the scene, it was discovered that this cruelty was done not by just one, but two lions. And later on, it was confirmed that several other workmen had just vanished from their tents the past few days in the exact same fashion. Ungan Singh was simply the first recognized victim of the two lions that would later be called the Savo Man-Eaters, the Ghosts and the Darkness.